come talk to me about it if you think it's awesome also. Um, and we're really excited today to have our inaugural morsel given by Morgan Mark, who is a graduate student in the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Natural Resources at Rutgers. Um, uh, if I know this correctly, Morgan, please correct me if I don't. Um, Morgan got her undergraduate degree in bio environmental engineering in 2022. Holy that is God, awesome. it's, it's very recent and also I'm very old. Um, but uh, Morgan's research focuses on uh, infectious disease ecology and zoonoses and wildlife. And she's going to talk to us today about models of infectious diseases and scavengers. Take it away, Morgan. Uh, we're looking forward to your morsel and then we're looking forward to a fun conversation afterwards. Fantastic. Okay, so um, without further ado, Nina already introduced me, so thank you so much for that. But just wanted to say good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to my morsel. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about how Nina and I are actually have a very um, good working partnership right now, and we're trying to examine scavenging from a spillover perspective. So we're trying to model exactly how um, scavenging can affect the disease transmission from carcass or other scavengers out of carcass to other animals. So we typically think about scavengers as providing important ecosystem services, right? They're nature's cleanup crew. So they remove that decaying matter that can potentially infect other animals. So in doing so, they help manage the spread of disease. Scavengers often have strong immune systems and stomach acid that neutralizes pathogens and reduces the likelihood of infection for that scavenger. But what happens when those defenses aren't sufficient and scavengers are also susceptible to a pathogen that can be found on a carcass? So these diseases in general that can infect multiple species are called zoonoses, and they're concerning from both a wildlife and public health perspective. Um, you know, just to give you a figure, zoonoses account for 60% of known infectious disease in humans, and that number will only continue to increase as humans have more interactions with wildlife. And these don't even need to be direct human to wildlife interactions. You know, these wild animals can interact with our pets or our livestock, which then of course interact with us, forming another linkage for disease transmission to humans. So understanding how disease spreads amongst wildlife and potentially from wildlife to humans is critical for understanding how these diseases can also impact us. So I'm broadly interested in understanding how scavenging can influence disease in scavenger populations. And most previous research has focused on how scavenging can reduce the spread of disease in the quote unquote prey populations or the animals that the scavengers are eating. But relatively little is known about how scavengers could be affected by what they eat and in turn how that can affect us. So one way that Nina and I have been trying to address this question is through a modified SIR model. So SIR models keep track of the number of or proportion of individuals in a susceptible, infected, or resistant compartment of a population. So by understanding these three equations, this model gives you a sense of how disease spreads in a population. So on the left here, I have the most basic form of the SIR model, which really only accounts for the spread of disease between animals of the same species or intraspecific disease transmission. So, you know, of course, when we're dealing with scavenging, that's um, not specifically an intraspecific um, mechanism of transmission. A scavenger could become infected from a carcass. So to model this external source of disease, um, we added a, an extra term in the basic SIR model that accounts for a constant infection rate from carcasses. So just graphically showing what that looks like, on the left here is our standard SIR model, right? And susceptible individuals can become infected and then infected individuals can become recovered. But this is all happening within a population of the same species. When we account for scavenging, we have dead carcasses in the equation now, which can act as an additional mechanism of infection, converting susceptible scavenger individuals to infected individuals. So it's just interesting to kind of see how this dynamic where we incorporate carcasses now um, can affect typical SIR dynamics. So we're still in the very rudimentary phases of model analyses. So um, these are kind of just different scenarios that we can get the model to do, but these parameters are not necessarily realistic or 
um, you know, based in any literature per se. The main point of this slide was kind of just to show, you know, we can get the model to do some pretty interesting things depending on how we define our parameters. So in the top left here, we have a pretty standard SIR curve where you have a peak in the number of infections. And eventually over time, as individuals become infected and then they recover, your population shifts from an entirely susceptible population to an entirely recovered. So this is pretty standard and um, typically used in a lot of epidemiological models for human diseases. But if we just tweak those parameters and um, kind of increase that recovery rate, so again, these are not realistic, just showing what the model can do, we can get extremely different outcomes of disease. So you can see as opposed to this peak in infections here, we get maybe a little uptick, but eventually infections go to zero and we're left with just susceptible and resistant individuals. So that's a pretty interesting um, alteration that we can get. If we tweak that re um, recovery rate again, we can almost get the opposite um, outcome where every individual in the population is essentially infected all the time. So this is if recovery is you know, essentially non-existent um, and all resistant individuals, or I'm sorry, all susceptible individuals in the population are essentially infected. And finally, we can get kind of any combination of outcomes in between. So this one on the bottom right shows that if you alter these parameters again, we can show that the disease does have a slight um, uptick in infections here, but it eventually goes to zero before all individuals in this population become infected. So now we're left with almost a non-zero um, number of susceptible individuals that just never got infected, but the disease already has already died out. So there's no opportunity for them to really become infected. So in summary, um, depending on how you define your infection rates and your recovery rates, you can get some drastically different outcomes. And um, this is just important to understand because it shows that scavengers can become infected um, as, as a function of scavenging. But of course, that depends on the system that you're looking at and how these, um, these infection rates are parameterized in real systems. So that was an interesting thing to see. Uh, secondly, Nina and I have been working on another model that is a little more complex. Um, we've modified what is called a concurrency model, which was first popularized by Kretschmar and Morris in 1995. And the application that they used for their concurrency model was to examine the spread of sexually transmitted diseases in humans. So the elegant thing about the concurrency model is that you're looking at individuals in the population and you're also examining when they form pairs in this context, sexual partnerships in which the disease can be transmitted between individuals. So it kind of shows that mechanistic link. And we thought that this would be an interesting application to our scavenger model, because if we model scavengers as individuals, and we also consider carcass as individuals, scavengers go to a carcass, that is when the pair forms and the potential for disease transmission occurs. So it's a it's a little it's a little abstract, but I um, I'm going to try to explain it with this simple figure here. So I said that we're treating scavengers and carcasses as individual entities. So there are essentially four different combinations or possibilities of pairwise formation between these two entities. You can have an uninfected scavenger that comes to an uninfected carcass. So there's really no possibility of disease transmission. You could have an infected scavenger, um, I denoted infected things with this red dot, that visits an uninfected carcass. And the carcass itself is not, um, it's not alive, right? So the, the pathogen of interest is probably not replicating within this carcass. But if an infected scavenger comes and eats part of the carcass, probably leaves its saliva, some other um, you know, bodily fluids on the carcass, that then becomes a contaminated carcass that could further infect other scavengers down the line that come. So this is kind of how we're rationalizing the infected carcass part of this uh, partnership. So that scenario is kind of demonstrated here where we have an infected carcass that has been essentially converted into a fomite by an infected scavenger. And then that can continually infect uninfected scavengers that come and eat at that carcass. And finally, the 
last possible iteration of this uh, scenario is that you have an infected scavenger eating at an infected carcass. So um, just kind of interesting to think about carcasses in this way. But again, um, pretty rudimentary uh, model analysis at this point. We've kind of just been looking at the possible outcomes, uh, much like what we did for the SIR model. So um, as you can see, depending on the values of the parameters that you assign, you can get very different outcomes. And under the hood, we have some um, complicated equations that kind of variables, but um, we're still working on figuring out what the best way to parameterize these is. So the take home that I'm kind of um, getting from this aspect is that you can model successful disease transmission. Um, and of course this has a lot to do on the parameters that you choose, but through experimentation and literature review, I'm hoping to obtain some more realistic values for these parameters and try to come up with more realistic models that can explain um, these phenomenon in our study system. So just to kind of go into some future steps, um, we're gonna be doing some model sensitivity analyses to figure out which parameters are most important for the spread of disease. But I'm also going to be embarking on a field project where I will be deploying I will be deploying deer carcasses across the state of New Jersey and trying to see what scavengers are coming um, and you know figure out some of these parameters that we can use for our models. So that's what's in store for me for the next couple of months is dragging deer around the woods, but I'm really excited to see how that can inform the models that Nina and I developed. So from all of these modeling and the data that I hope to obtain from my field project, um, I basically want to demonstrate that it's important to understand how disease spreads in wildlife and in my study system, scavengers in particular, because that can really affect not only disease transmission between different animals, but from animals to humans. And as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't even need to be a direct interaction between a person and a wild animal. It could be a person and a carcass. It could be a person and their pets. So there's many different ways that this can happen. And in light of COVID-19 and other pandemics that are looming, um, it's important to understand how these zoonoses can um, impact. And um, yeah, so with that, I just want to thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, I just wanted to add a fun note that these pictures that you saw throughout the presentation were actually from a prototype of my field project. Um, I had a, a friend who had hunted a deer and left the, the viscera out and I was like, I'm going to put a camera on that. So we got a lot of interesting scavengers coming and eating the carcass. So this is what's in store for me for the next couple months. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, chat about my research and my contact is there if you want to email.